Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel, and this is part of the good stuff. This is the AAS Journal Author Series, and I am super happy to have Veronica Narlock and Gergay Waju with us today. And I hope I did okay on this. <laughs> uh, That's Veronica, really Veronica, how are you doing and where are you at these days? Oh, uh, well, I have to be fine. I'm at the very moment I am uh, in, in the observatory Cerro Amazonas, which is uh, at the Cerro Malfi, very close to Paranal cool. in Chile. Very cool. Very nice. And Gergay, where are you located at? I'm currently in my office in uh, Warsaw, Poland. Okay. Very nice. Um, let's see. Let's do some little stuff. Uh, Veronica, let's see. We must be heading into spring in the Southern Hemisphere. Spring. Well, right? <laughs> no, it's rather end of winter. winter, not winter. spring yet. Yeah, it's not yeah. quite getting there yet. We got a little. No, no, not winter. yet. Not yet. Does it snow? But, there? Uh, but the weather for the observations is pretty, pretty well. Does it snow? It snow? No, no. Okay. No, well, it's very even quite warm, I would say. Cool. Thank you, Gay. How is summer in Poland? Well, it just got uh, much colder the, in the last few days. It was about 30 degrees Celsius, and now it's more like 17, 18. Wow. Okay. So, Very cool. So it is September 1 of 2023 as we record this, and I'm in Phoenix, and we actually got one of our summer storms uh, last night, which is called a monsoon, um, or a haboob as it goes through. Uh, and so we dropped a good, you know, a good, uh, you know, 10 degrees C, let's say. Um, so it was actually fairly cool this morning in the desert. So very good. And Veronica, what do you like to do for research? Well, uh, for a long time, I was very much into global clusters. Uh, but recently I switched into uh, single stars and uh, especially the period luminosity relations in the long bands. Cool. Very cool. And Gregay, what do you like to do for research? Well, I also mostly work on variable stars, uh, especially pulsating ones around Lyra mm -hmm. and Cephades. Mm -hmm. Cool. Very nice. And that is going to bring us to this very awesome... AJ article, APJ article, oops, skip that one. So it's open access, it's the open access era people. You can go get a copy for free, go grab one. Period luminosity relations for galactic classical Cepheids in the Sloan bands and Veronica and Sergei, take us away. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about this article. Uh, and a special shout out to our uh, co-authors who are all members of the Araucaria collaboration, Araucaria project, which has the main goal of improving the distance determinations uh, uh, in the cosmos, basically. So especially with uh, regards to the ongoing Hubble tension. So like, uh, this, ten like the, this tension between the locally uh, measured Hubble the Hubble constant value and what is inferred from the cosmic microwave background. Yes. So the article is actually uh, connected to this because it provides uh, first for the first time period luminosity relationships for classical cephates measured using uh, galactic classical cephates in the Sloan uh, bands. Cool. So classical. Uh, Cephates are very useful distance indicators in the local universe because they have uh, they are very bright and they have very characteristic uh, positions um, that mean that you we can observe their light changing by almost one magnitude uh, mm -hmm. depending on the band mm -hmm. and uh, so because of this they are bright and uh, they have uh, characteristic light curves they are very easy to find in other galaxies even at uh, large distances if you use something like Hubble. Mm -hmm. And uh, why we are interested in particularly in the Sloan bands is that because the Sloan photometric bands have become very widespread in astronomy in the last two and a half decades, three decades almost. Okay. Because previously most data for uh, variable stars have been obtained in the Johnson uh, photometric system. Yes. Which uh, in order to use uh, the Sloan band observations to derive distances, 
you need to have period luminosity relationships in the Sloan bands. And this is especially important uh, because there is the upcoming uh, um, legacy survey of space and time, mm -hmm. LSST, mm -hmm. right. that will be conducted uh, with a dedicated uh, eight meter. Um, how big is that? Uh, six and a half meter uh, telescope at, mm -hmm. uh, in Chile. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, that will, um, in the local universe, will uh, uncover many, many uh, variable stars, including eclipsing and pulsating variables as well. So not just cephates, but also other kinds of pulsating variables. Yes. And in the future, we will also provide period luminosity relationships for those kind of variables. But in this article, we are focusing on the uh, classical cephates, which are um, arguably the most important ones. Uh, for the purposes of uh, distance determination in the local universe. Cool. So, uh, as defined originally, uh, the Sloan system has five photometric bands called UGRIZ from mm -hmm. uh, ultraviolet to the beginning of near infrared, let's uh, say, let's call it like that. Yeah. And um, we in specifically uh, focused on the GRI filters out of these three, uh, mostly because um, uh, mostly because the telescopes that we have used for our observations, the uh, LAS, uh, these forty centimeter robotic uh, telescopes of the LAS Cumbres uh, Global Telescope Network is are sensitive to these and. Uh, Yes. These bands are, provide fairly okay uh, period luminosity relationships and fairly tight period luminosity relationships. So uh, what we have been doing is we have selected a sample of about a hundred uh, classical cephates that are not too bright because some cephates are too bright for 40 centimeter telescopes. Uh, but they are also not too far, uh, because if they are too far, then the uh, Gaia uh, astrometric missions parallaxes, which we use to determine their distances, are become unreliable because the errors are relatively too large. So we selected this uh, sample of uh, cephates up to a distance of about four-ish kiloparsec away from us. Okay. where the errors are generally 3% or lower on the distance determined using uh, the data release tree of Gaia. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, the good thing about using a robotic telescope network that's global is that uh, you can just program the uh, your request to fill up the... Uh, the light curve in all of its phases. Because if you are using a telescope at a single uh, location on the Earth, you can have problems with the coverage, especially if your period is close to a multiple of the day. Yes. So, <laughs> so it was uh, very useful to use these telescopes for these purposes. And yeah. in yeah. the section that you highlighted, you are describing the data somewhat. Mm -hmm. And if you scroll down a little, Sure. I think here uh, we are already talking about the data reduction. So I would uh, hand it over to Veronica to talk about this part. Right. Yes. Um, for the data reduction, we used uh, actually very popular uh, programs like DO code, right? And uh, we used the uh, aperture photometry with the fixed uh, size of the aperture, which was uh, uh, containing the whole light from the star. Okay. And uh, for the reference stars, we chose the stars just to up to few uh, magnitudes fainter than the target. And that was also important because, unfortunately, the, the SB cameras you mounted on the 40 centimeter telescopes, uh, okay. they suffer from the, uh, um, the non-linearity, which we uh, also we, we tried to um, minimize uh, as, as possible. I think the additional uh, coefficient in the uh, equations that you can see on the uh, in the right column, mm. and uh, okay, I'm with you. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, so we can go down, I guess. <laughs> okay, there's our instrumental magnitude. So uh, we obtained our light curves, which we later um, uh, phased, obviously, and uh, calculated the intensity average 
mean apparent magnitudes uh, for them. Uh, and in the next step, we fitted the Polar series to obtain the mean magnitudes for yeah. those stars. Uh, yes, uh, the section 2.3 is pretty uh, important. It's about the red ink. Uh, ah. That was, gave us a bit of a headache at the very beginning uh, <laughs> because, uh, well, there, there are, exist many different reddening maps. Yes. But mm, they were not very uh, suitable for our case. Uh, for right. example, Schlegel map. It's a map which is integrated to the infinity. We used even the the, uh, the model of the of the galaxy to calculate the reddening for all our targets, uh, but it was still um, resulting in a big artificial spread. Okay. So uh, there exist more uh, in nowadays uh, maps like, for example, Gaia Thomas 3D map, but unfortunately that one has a limit up to three kiloparsecs. Uh, another map is a Bayer Star 2019 map, mm -hmm. uh, but that one uh, is not covering uh, specific galactic regions where our satellites were. So in the end, we decided to go for a compromise and used a bit older uh, values uh, of the reddening given by Perny uh, in okay. his work in 1995. Uh, we decided not to mix different sources of, of the reddening, so we ended up uh, with reddening for 86 stars okay. from our samples. Okay, uh, okay. then we also ex uh, adopted extension vectors for, uh, for the PAN-STARS uh, system uh, from Green et al. 2019. But also we calculated them directly from the Fitzpatrick uh, 1999 uh, okay. reddening law for the comparison. Mm -hmm. And here we can go to another section, which is about the distances of our uh, clusters, 2.4 okay. and uh, clusters, sorry, <laughs> surface, obviously. Uh, so we use the, the Gaia DR3 catalog. Uh, for, for for the for the parallaxes, which okay. are important to calculate the absolute magnitudes of uh, satellites, mm -hmm. and uh, as many years before us, we also uh, corrected them uh, for, for the zero point uh, offset, which we uh, for which we used the uh, Lindegren um, 2021 paper. Okay, and the average correction was about minus twenty nine micro arc seconds okay okay yeah uh, so the we also judge the quality of the parallaxes based on two parameters which is uh, rufa and cough and we rejected the stars which were which had the rufa parameter higher than 1.4 and the golf parameter higher than to 12.5 uh, okay. so we rejected seven stars in total Okay. And also we had rejected additional two because of the bad quality of their light curves. Uh, so the mean parallax uncertainty was about 21 micro seconds, which is uh, yeah. in the end of this section. Yeah. Uh, so in the next step, uh, when we already have the ma uh, magnitude, uh, absolute magnitudes of our stars, we uh, decided to derive the purity luminosity relations and laser plus purity present height relations. We did that in two, uh, using two methods. Uh, first one, which we, let's call it a classical method, the liner, yes. and uh, also the astrometry based luminosity ABL method. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, to minimize the, the, the correlation between the slope and intercept in the, in the equation, uh, we applied the pivot period, uh, which we chose uh, as log p equal one. Okay. Uh, for the period luminosity relation, as we need a um, uh, reddening for, uh, in this case, uh, we ended up with seventy six stars, uh, mm -hmm. which were um, from this between in the distances between like zero point six to seven point eight kiloparsecs. Uh, some of them are. are farther away just because we, we found also uh, satellites in the field of our primary target. 
-hmm. But the medium uh, distance was just 2.2 uh, kiloparsec. Uh, so the dominant statistical errors uh, comes from the parallaxes rather than uh, mean magnitudes. Okay. Uh, the difference of the coefficients between two methods, uh, they, they are slightly dif uh, differ, differ uh, and uh, the difference is higher for the for the slopes than the than the intercepts, uh, and then in the next section, on the next page, we derive also the Kirov ah. Bezan height indices. Ah, there we go. I missed that. Okay. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah. Here is here is our uh, that was a that was the uh, figure yeah. presenting our result uh, for the period luminosity relation. Uh, yes. Uh, so. Present height indices, also called magnitudes, uh, we defined three of them, and as uh, it, it, for the remaining factors which we used for defining for the definition of those uh, indices, uh, were coming from Green et al. 2019, and also its part uh, reddening law. Cool, I'm with you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, so as uh, in this case, we do not need to correct for the reddening. Uh, so we could use more stars than in the case of the period luminosity relation. Uh, and again, we fitted our period present height relations with uh, two methods, classical and ABL methods. Yes. So in general, in this case, which uh, we used about 84, 83 in one case uh, stars, uh, also from a bit larger distances, um, but median distance was about 2.4 kiloparsecs. Okay. And yes, so uh, now we can have uh, discuss the, the, the section four, which is the discussion. Uh, in the section 4.1, we, uh, we discussed the stars, uh, which we rejected during our fitting. Uh, if you will go back maybe to, the, to our period luminosity relations, uh, it, uh, is that the figure? The figure. Oh, uh, um, uh, I think it was on the. Which figure? Oh, yes, yes. Here, here. Yeah, yeah. So, yes. So, uh, as you can see, um, the most obvious outlier uh, the, 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 in the top, yes, it's a uh, S crew, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is uh, which is defined as a double or multiple uh, star. Ah, and uh, right. Accor according to Sabados' 1996 uh, paper, uh, where is it, he lists that spectroscopic binaries, uh, we find another eight uh, stars common with our sample. Okay. Uh, we remove them from the sample and repeat of the the, the fitting. Uh, but the results of the for the slope and intercepts they agreed within one sigma uncertainties. Uh, and those stars constitute to about seven to nine percent uh, of the sample for period luminosity or period present height relation. But as uh, Kaczmarek told, uh, 2023 show uh, the influence of binary surface okay. uh, on the distance modulus uh, for for that small binary fraction is is small, for, uh, so it can be neglected. So we did not reject those stars from our sample. Okay, what is uh, what is the difference between the solid line and the dash line? Uh, the solid line and dash line are the two methods we used uh, to okay. uh, so classical and ABL methods. I'm with you. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, okay. so uh, in the next subsection, which is four point two, let's go to four point two. We made a small test Over for time. the con. Yes, 1.2. Yes, we are here. Uh, so we are made a small test for the first overtone contamination. We are uh, we knew about that, that our subjects are fundamental mode, but we made it just a small check. We applied the period cutoff at five days, which is log P of 0.7 days. Okay. Uh, but the, 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 our coefficients agreed very well uh, with the previous one, so that keeps, assures us about the purity of our sample. Check. Good check. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> uh, so uh, then, in the next subsection, uh, we check the, the influence of the parallax zero point of the uh, as I said already, we used uh, the the the, ops, uh, the 
the zero points offset uh, calculated uh, based on uh, Lindegren 2021. Yeah. But we checked also uh, what will happen if we don't use the corrections at all, or we use the, the recipe given by uh, Grunewald in 2021. Okay. So in the first case, where we do not apply any corrections, uh, slopes are sli uh, steeper slightly more than one sigma, and zero points on average are smaller by about uh, two, uh, 0 0.12 uh, magnitude for period luminosity relations and 0 0.14 for period present height, okay. which is... Uh, uh, we have to keep in mind that for the period we don't have, we use a bit uh, it's surfacing a bit larger distances. So that might be uh, the reason. Yeah. And uh, as for the Grunewald, the new mean correction uh, was about minus 20 micro seconds. Okay. And uh, slopes were slightly steeper, but the in intercepts were uh, just slightly smaller, by 0 0.02 magnitude. Okay. Uh, so yeah. everything looks within one sigma uh, uh, uncertainty. Great. And then uh, we uh, checked the dependence on the metallicity. Yeah. Well, uh, for that, we applied the values for, of metallicity for our surface from a compilation uh, given by uh, Bruvel et al. 2021. And uh, the range of metallicities for our surface was not very large. Okay. Uh, we got the values for 65 of our uh, objects and um, well, uh, the the can, can, can the I seat was this? with yeah sure. <laughs> so uh, if you would go to the figure uh, above, okay, in in the same page. Ah, there we go. Yes, so this shows the uh, residuals uh, as a function of the metallicities, and if you okay. would zoom in on the on the uh, x-axis so that we actually can see the values there. You can see that uh, the fades are in a very tiny range around uh, ah. around solar metallicity. And mm -hmm. that is because these fades are close to us in the galactic disk, where most of the stars uh, that are young have uh, solar metallicity or very close to solar metallicity. Mm -hmm. In order to judge uh, if there is a metallicity dependence, we need to go farther in the galactic disk. But the problem is that uh, the, the Gaia parallaxes become uh, like very, very noisy. The uh, zero point corrections for the Gaia parallaxes become even more important. Yeah. So uh, what you people usually do in studies, they use the fades in the large and the small Magellanic cloud to get yeah. a handle on how the period luminosity relation is changing for uh, low metallicity surfaces. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, it's just that uh, the problem is that we have good data for surfaces that are close to us in the galactic disk, but at the Magellanic clouds, uh, they are uh, basically at the same distance when you are talking about surface in, uh, in the different galaxies. So mm -hmm. it's, it's and, and also the small range of the metallicity was exactly the reason why we didn't want to uh, uh, derive the pure luminosity metallicity relation for, for our surface. Yes. Okay. Very good. And yeah. So, uh, so uh, in the next section, we actually can go to the, to the next uh, image. Uh, Okay. Uh, we also made a comparison of our uh, slopes uh, using both two methods uh, uh, with the slopes in the same filters, but in the other galaxies or in our galaxy, but with other filters. Uh, and uh, well, the, the general ag agreement uh, with theoretical, uh, both theoretical and observational results okay. are um, are quite quite good, and they show the general trend that the slopes become steeper at longer wavelengths and uh, also uh, the shallower. slopes from shallower shallower ah. steeper shallower here, longer longer here. Wavelengths. yeah and longer steeper wavelengths and wavelength. yeah, yeah. yeah yeah okay <laughs> sorry all good uh, all good uh, yeah. Also, the, our uh, slopes from, from the liner and APL methods, uh, they also differ uh, and the difference is bigger for the, for the longer wave, wavelengths uh, as for the for the difference, uh, we also see the difference uh, between uh, um, the results from when we're using retaining factors from the green and uh, Fitzpatrick law. 
Yeah. And uh, they are the largest for G uh, band, and uh, they are very similar for R and I. Uh, and we can okay. go to another uh, picture then, where we uh, apply. This is an awesome picture. I like this thing. <laughs> this one's good. Uh, yes. So on another figure, uh, we uh, up, um, use we compare the, ourselves with theoretical slopes from the Christian zone, uh, but they were predicted for SDSS system. Yeah. Uh, we applied our zero points and overplotted them over uh, over our uh, period luminosity and period present height relations. Okay. Uh, and they're showing quite a good agreement. Uh, the worst agreement is uh, for the G band, but for the R and I, they, they look pretty well. And also, uh, we use the period luminosity, empirical period luminosity relations for N31 uh, classical surface, uh, okay. presented by Codrit at all 2018. Uh, which we shifted by the distance modulus uh, calculated by, by Lee et al. 2021, which, okay. by the way, also was based on Cephate. And we overplotted that over our uh, results. And uh, we think that the comparison is also very satisfactory mm. um, for, 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 uh, for, for those uh, empirical relations. Um, although the, the worst agreement is in G-band, obviously. And, but R and I are... Even yeah, better. I look pretty good. So yes, so the conclusion for from this uh, is that uh, well, the biggest differences we see actually in the G band and also in the Fitzpatrick uh, when we use the, the coefficients from the Fitzpatrick law, uh, which only means that uh, the applied reddening law does matter, and it is particularly important for the bluer filters. Um, it, where the where the yeah. reddening laws differ the most, and uh, well, uh, we, we recommend using uh, G band and also Bessel height indices based on it uh, for for the distance scale purposes with a caution. Um, well, as it is very sensitive to to the applied reddening law and also the. Uh, period luminosities uh, have the highest uh, uncertainties in the blue bands and uh, also the uh, intrinsic spread of the instability strip is yeah. the highest, cool. which is not, not, not really surprising. And then we conclude our paper with, uh, with the conclusions in the last sections. section. Very cool. Very nice. Gergay, you want to add it? Yes, uh, so about the future prospects or ah. future work to be done. Sure. Uh, of course, uh, it's always uh, important to increase the number of stars that are covered uh, for the derivation of such a period luminosity relationship to like, beat down the errors, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's uh, we are planning to do that in two ways. One is adding, of course, more uh, galactic cephates. Okay. But two, we also have uh, obtained uh, like time series data for cephates in the large and small Magellanic clouds using okay. three different classes of uh, telescopes. Because the uh, problem is that uh, the, there is just uh, like the brightest cephates in the Magellanic clouds have magnitudes of about 12, while the faintest ones are ending at around 17. Okay. So it's a large range, so you would, uh, and also their periods, the short period ones are like below one day, while the longest period ones are above 100 days. Yeah. So you need uh, very uh, different time scales. So mm -hmm. for the short period ones, we have uh, Beckham data uh, okay. obtained. So that's a, only a few nights, but it's at high mm -hmm. cadence and all night long. Uh, for the medium ones, we have obtained uh, with the Vista Survey Telescope, so that's uh, located at Paranal, and for the, the brightest ones, we have actually uh, had a, like a targeted campaign with the one meter telescopes of the Las Cumbres uh, Observatory Network. So cool. once you combine all these data, we should have uh, like complete coverage for in these bands, at least in the GRI bands for uh, cephates in the Magellanic clouds. Nice. And another uh, prospect that we are, of course, working on is uh, providing period luminosity relationships in the, for different kinds of variable stars. 
Okay. Uh, so not not just classical cephate, but also type two cephates, which yeah. are uh, yeah. like basically the like the low metallicity equivalents of uh, classical cephates. Yeah. But at the same period, they are uh, fainter by about one, one and a half magnitudes. But for systems that don't contain classical cephates, which are young stars, so in the galaxy you would have you would basically need active star formation to yeah. uh, produce the classical cephates. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that some galaxies like ellipticals just don't have so uh, active star formation and uh, of course there are other types of variables like RLI rate which are also very important uh, actually LSST is expected to find RLI rate stars that are outside of galaxies that have escaped Ooh. for example from Ooh. the Milky Way those are, of course, uh, so they are, that are located in between galaxies. Right. And those will be also very important to know at exactly what distance they are. So we are also planning to do that. And uh, the data for that has been uh, observed uh, already, and Veronica is uh, working on the next paper. Awesome. Related. Very good. Very good. Cool. Well, I really look forward to seeing uh, this field evolve over the next couple of years. We got a whole bunch of new data coming in. Got some nice relationships from this article right here. So very nice. I look forward to this. So Veronica Gerge, I want to thank you so much again for walking us through your very lovely article. Very nice. Thank you very much. And that will do everyone. And I hope this made your astronomy day just a little bit better. And we will see you on the next one. Bye-bye. Bye. Goodbye. -bye. Bye.